Hello, this is segment four of our Ray Franz on 1975 with uh, some comments by David interspersed because uh, I didn't know what was going on at headquarters, but headquarters knew something of what we were doing out in the world at the time. So our impressions, Ray, that is Ray's inside the house and the rest of us, pioneers, etc., outside the house, often bring different angles to the same period of time. As part of the, a headquarters organization that was flush with joy because of writing of a crest of remarkable growth, there was not much that could be done, however. Some articles on the subject that came to me for editing, I tried to moderate, but that was about all. In my personal activity, I did try to draw attention to the scriptures just mentioned, that is the ones about Christ's caution on knowing the day of the hour. He tried to draw attention to them, he says, but both in private conversations and in public talks he could do very little while he was in the minority on the governing body. One Sunday evening in 1974, after my wife and I had returned from a speaking engagement in another part of the country, my uncle, that is Fred Franz, then vice president, came over to our room. His eyesight being extremely poor, we usually read the Watchtower study material out loud to him each week. My wife mentioned to him that in my talk that weekend, I had cautioned the brothers about coming, becoming unduly excited over 1975. His quick response was, and why shouldn't they get excited? It's something to get excited about. There is no question in my mind that of all the governing body members, the vice president was most convinced of the rightness of what he had written and on which others writing had built. On another evening in the summer of 1975, an elderly Greek brother named Peterson, originally Papa Gyropoulos, joined in our reading, as was his custom. After the reading, my uncle said to Peterson, you know, it was very much like this in 1914. Right up into the summer months, everything was quiet. Then all of a sudden, things began to happen and the war broke out. So I think that paragraph and the one prior to it more than adequately give an insight into what was going on inside the house, the house of God, Bethel, in Brooklyn. Really, the excitement about 1975 was generated by the prophetic speculation of one man, and that man was Ray Franz's uncle Fred, this point vice president, and then a couple of years later to become president of the society. Ray Franz goes on earlier, toward the start of 1975, President Noor had made a trip around the world, taking Vice President Franz with him. The Vice President's speeches in all countries visited centered on 1975. Upon their return, the other members of the governing body, having heard reports from many countries of the stirring effect of the Vice President's talk, asked to hear a tape recording of it made in Australia. In his talk, the Vice President spoke of 1975 as, quote, a year of great possibilities, tremendous probabilities, unquote. He told his audience that according to the Hebrew calendar, they were already in the fifth lunar month of 1975, with less than seven lunar months remaining. He emphasized several times that the Hebrew year would close with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, September 5th, 1975. Acknowledging that much would have to happen in that short time, in the final wind-up, if the final wind-up was to come by then, he went on to talk about the possibility of a year or so difference due to some lapse of time between Adam's creation and Eve's creation. He made reference to the failure of expectations in 1914 and 1925 and quoted Rutherford's remark, I made an ass of myself. Of course, that admission by Rutherford did not make it into print in the 1970s. He said that the organization had learned not to make very bold extreme predictions. Toward the close, he urged his listeners not to take an improper view, however, and assume that the coming destruction could be, quote, years away, unquote, and focus their attention on other matters, such as getting married and raising families, building up a fine business venture, or spending years at college in some engineering course. Now, of course, today we don't 
realized that Fred Franz was a lifelong bachelor, as far as I can recall, and not having a family of his own and never having to work outside Watchtower headquarters for most of his 99 years, of course had no experience of living on the outside, so he could not have realized the havoc this position, this extreme position on prophecy, was imposing upon many lives individually and family. Back to Ray. After hearing the tape, a few of the governing body members expressed concern that if, indeed, no, quote, very bold extreme predictions were being made, some subtle predictions were, and the effect was palpably evident in the excitement generated by Fred Franz's tour. This was the first time that concern was expressed in the governing body discussions. But no action was taken, no policy de decided upon. The Vice President repeated many of the points of the same talk on March 2, 1975, at the following Gilead School graduation. So 1975 passed, as had 1881, 1914, 1918, 1920, 1925, and the 1940s. Much publicity was given by others as to the failure of the organization's expectations surrounding 1975. There was considerable talk among Jehovah's Witnesses themselves. In my own mind, most of what was said did not touch upon the major point of the matter. I felt that the real issue went far beyond that of some individual's accuracy or inaccuracy, or even an organization's reliability or untrustworthiness, or its members' sens sensibleness or gullibility. It seems to me that the really important factor is how such predictions ultimately reflect on God and on His Word. When men make such forecasts and say that they are doing it on the basis of the Bible, build up arguments for these from the Bible, assert that they are God's channel of communication, what is the effect when their forecasts prove false? Does it honor God? or build up faith in him and in the reliability of his word? Or is the opposite the result? Does it not give added inducement for some to feel justified in placing little importance upon the Bible's message and teachings? Those witnesses who made major changes in their lives in most cases could and did pick up the pieces and go on living in spite of being disillusioned. Not all could. Whatever the case, however, Serious damage had been done in more ways than one. The credibility of God and Jesus and Scripture, therefore, as Ray Franz notes here, was at stake. I had several friends during this period who left the organization, some voicing their complaints, others just drifting off. I had other friends, many more actually, who got married and started having families right away in that period from about 1976 to 1982 in the wake of these very events that uh, Ray Franz is summing up the aftermath of here. In 1976, he goes on, a year after the passing of that widely publicized date, a few members of the governing body began urging that some statement should be made, acknowledging that the organization had been in error had stimulated false expectations. Others said they did not think we should, that it would just give ammunition to opposers. Milton Henschel recommended that the wise course would be simply not to bring the matter up, and that in time the brothers would stop talking about it. There was clearly not enough support for a motion favoring a statement to carry any kind of apology in print. That year, an article in the July 15th Watchtower did refer to the failed expectations, but the article had to conform to the prevailing sentiment within the governing body, and no clear acknowledgement of the organization's responsibility was possible. When I was an elder in the Watchtower, I was taught that as elders, when we had a judicial hearing with anyone, what we were looking for was not just a report of the sin, the facts about the sin, but the attitude displayed by the erring one, the one who had fallen into sin and error. And I was told that the operative principle should be Proverbs 28 verse 13, where it says in various translations something along the lines of, he that is confessing his sin and leaving it or repenting of it, he should be shown mercy. So when I was assessing the 
uh, credibility of the governing body in the wake of these events some five to ten years later in the 80s when my thoughts and doubts were becoming more severe uh, I had to assess them that is the organization by the same principle I had been taught as an elder namely that repentance meant confessing sin acknowledging sin culpability and along with that your ongoing credibility of as a spokesperson for God might be measured you might have to suffer some chastisement and discipline but you showed the right attitude now this is what comes to mind as I read Ray Franz's description here there's no real repentance going on for their responsibility so in the next segment we'll talk about the ongoing debate about whether they should even acknowledge responsibility for what had happened in 1975